What's up? Welcome back to the booth. It's great to have you along. My name's Riley, and I'm joined by Paul Cheon. We're still coming down off that hype oh, train. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm still kind of shaking That's a little it, bit man. I mean, we've match. just uh, disembarked, yeah, grabbing our baggage, and it's time now, of course, to get into our second uh, quarterfinal here at our Approach of Devastation. We've got the players lined up and ready to go down to the feature match area, so let's not tarry any longer. It's time for our second uh, quarterfinal here at Pro Tour Arab Devastation. Hello, my friends, and welcome to coverage of Pro Tour Arab Devastation. It's our second quarterfinal, my friends, and my name's Riley. I'm joined by Paul Cheon. A pleasure and a privilege to have him at my side as we get into this next game of Magic. A best of five match between, of course, Wing Chun Yam and Curata. Oh, sorry, Shintaro Curata. You see uh, Yam Wing Chun on your screen just there. He's cool, calm, collected, ready to go, but an emotional finish to his, uh, to his tournament yesterday. This guy was... Uh, Really, really hit for six once he managed to get the get the, the top eight slot for himself. He's up against Shintaro Kurata, who we can see here is just ready to get into it. He is uh, certainly cool, calm, collected. He's come with his game face on, and he's ready to to uh, chuck some punches around in the feature match area. And these two are ready to get underway. So Paul Cheon, looking across their list, we've got another red deck and uh, a bit of a, a red-black uh, spicy one going on here as yeah, well. Yeah, it's a bit of a pseudo-mirror. They, they're both playing a Raminap Ruins aggressive strategy. But Shintaro Kurata opting to add black to his deck um, for a bit more power and a few more options. He's got four copies of Amit Eternal, three copies of Collective Brutality, and a Cut to Ribbons. Really nice finisher here for Kirata as he gets things opening up with a Foreboding Ruins. And uh, he, again, uh, that just gives him access to just more things to do with his mana in the late game. Now, Wing, uh, Wing Chun Yam here, he didn't get underway with a one drop, but Yam has managed to drop a, a, a Kari Zev on the battlefield here on turn number two. Kirata having no issues with his mana. Earthshaker Kendra is going to get in for two here. So, as you said, Paul Chian, characterizing it as this as an aggressive matchup, We've seen this sort of stuff before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, again, Shintaro opting to kind of slow down his deck a little bit. And, you know, he is adding a second color to his deck, but it's not totally free. Mm -hmm. He does, he does. his deck is a little bit slower. Playing four copies of Smoldering Marsh with only seven mountains and two swamps, oftentimes that's not going to be even able to come into play untapped, uh, which is going to be an issue. Also, you know, assuming he has a mountain or swamp in hand, uh, you know, he only has 15 red sources that come to play untapped turn one, which could be sometimes an issue when you're playing, of course, four copies of Falcon Wrath Gorger. Meanwhile, on the other side, Yam's playing 18 sources of red on turn one that come to play untapped. So, you know, the, the Raminap red deck, uh, a little bit more streamlined. Just a touch faster it is, for sure, right. as we see now. A very fast start, getting in for six here on turn three, and that's what Yam wants to be doing. He's hitting his traps for sure. But some of the options that it opens here for uh, Curata, uh, uh, it can just be game-breaking. Right, right, right. And I'm really interested to see just how the Amit Eternal plays in this specific matchup. Yeah. Uh, Shintara opting to play that over the Oncrop Crasher as his three-mana aggressive creature of choice. This guy's just huge. The Amit Eternal does not muck around. He's not here to make friends. Right. He is here to, uh, to chew bubblegum and, and, and get amongst some other stuff as well here. And uh, this guy as a three-mana five... <laughs> Sorry, just quickly. Yeah. Just quickly, Paul Town. A three-mana five-five. Oh, I thought you were laughing at Zombie Crocodile Demon. That also comes into <laughs> it, for sure. Yeah, just uh, we've got a bit of a Mist Form Ultima situation going on <laughs> yeah. here. Cut to Ribbons is going to kick things off here for Shintaro Kurata's second turn. Uh, Kari Zev yeah, does indeed take the worst of it. Okay. And a shock wow. as well. So just some good, honest, clean magic. Just uh, removal spells targeting creatures. And uh, this game, uh, we're transitioning now to the mid game. And both players poised to, to make a real run at it here. Yeah. The one thing with the Amid Eternal is I think in a lot of matchups, it's... it's uh, often going to be one of the biggest things on the board. But when you're playing against the red deck with a lot of cheap spells, mm. you can shrink it down enough where it's going to be irrelevant sometimes. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if you can play like one drop, one drop shock, then that's enough to kill it. Or, you know, if... Yeah, you can also just go, you know, one drop a braid or, yeah. or just play a few creatures and then like maybe block it. You know, so it is possible. Uh, again, uh, on Crop Crasher just been so impressive over the weekend. Yeah. I'm just really curious to see, you know, the evolution of kind of standard and what people really opt to go for for the three mana card of choice. Let's talk about this card here as well. Cut to ribbons. You see it on your screen there, and uh, this is another huge uh, game breaker, or it, it opens up the game enormously for um, uh, for the black red deck because essentially what it does now, you can look at uh, at Yam's life totals being 15 uh, as soon as there is a ribbons in the graveyard. If there were one, oh sorry, there is one right now. Of course, so you can see it hidden away there. Uh, his life total is effectively 15. It's a great finisher. Yeah, absolutely. Again, it's a great removal spell in the early game. And and then in the late game, just less, even less ways yeah. to get, of course, flooded. 
I'm not uh, entirely sure if it's even necessary, given that you already have so much to do with cards like Hazard and Ramina Bruins. But if not, I mean, again, Ram uh, cut to ribbons, we'll still get the job done. That's true. And I mean, we see people playing stuff like Incendiary Flow. I mean, that does go upstairs. That's a good point. But right. two mana for four damage, that's a great return on your investment. That is, that, that, yeah, certainly a much better rate when you're looking to deal with creatures. But there's a lot of utility in cards like Incendiary Flow as well because of the Exile Clause. You can use it on cards like Earthshaker Kenra and just permanently get rid of it, um, you know, and don't have to worry about the Eternalize. We see old EZK getting in here for a couple of points of damage. Earthshaker Kenra has been one of the defining cards of the tournament for me, Paul Chan. I mean, Absolutely. I've been privileged enough to see every moment of the uh, of the action here from Kyoto, Japan, and uh, this guy has, has really made a, a mark on this tournament. Yeah. Kirata now with three mana. He's going to go up to four. Ooh, mismatch basic. I knew you were going to say something. Well, I knew you were going to say something Of course, there. man. <laughs> of course. I mean, I saw it, and I was just like, I was just waiting. Just was waiting. Like <laughs> just poison ready to go. Bomo Curia is getting up and about. And an all-out attack from Kirata. And this is what the red deck wants to do. Wants to be turning those creatures sideways and racing Yam at the moment. So, Kur so Kirata kind of low on cards here. And Yam actually just, you know, Somewhat of a tricky decision there. Like, do you want to get rid of the Bomac Courier? Because, it, you know, we, we often talk about how this is kind of a, an attrition, attrition matchup. Yeah. Do you want to get rid of the Bomac Courier so it doesn't take over the game? Here's the big boy. Amit Eternal comes down. Three mana, five, five. That's how they shake out these days. Of course, you mentioned Paul already ways for Yam Wing Chun to deal with this card. Yam needs a land here. He needs a land here. He's got a Hazret in hand with another spell. If he draws a land, he can play Hazret and attack. Did he find a land here? Let's see. Let's see, playing Let's those cards close to his chest. I'm, uh, I think it's a Sun Scorched Desert. It is upstairs, ding you for one, and this is going to be a big turn for Yam here. All right, and he did find a land. That was huge. Hazard the Fervent comes down. Minus one, minus one counter on the Amid Eternal. No one's going to forget about that one. And, oh, look at this, the follow-up play. This is brutal stuff, Paul Cheon. Oh, did you see what he tried to do there, too? That was, that was a bluff. He tapped his one red man, I think, just kind of trying to signify that he might have a shock here. But oh. when, in, when, in fact, it's actually a Hazard at the Fervent. Look at those next-level plays here. Hazard at the Fervent gets in for five. Of course, no blocks available for Curata. That thing is indestructible. This guy, geez, she is just doing so much work. Right, right. And I also like the way Shintaro pl played uh, his sequencing with the, uh, the, the Amit Eternal, rather. He waited until basically kind of a later stage in the game where Yam Wing Chun kind of emptied out his hand so that it's far less likely for the, uh, the Amateur Eternal to shrink. And Yam just continuing to play these mind games. He's tapping, he's untapping, he's getting amongst <laughs> it, but uh, we know that he's just sitting with the Hazard at the Fervent yeah, in but, hand. But at the same time, Shintaro can't really play around mm. the shock, mm. right? We're in a racing situation. He's already down to six, and there's a Hazard at the Fervent on the battlefield. So he's not going to be like, oh, I can't attack with this thing because he tapped his red mana yeah, and untapped yeah, yeah. it. But still... Right. Good to see the little game skis going on here. <laughs> As Kirana now, he's going to dig deep because he's on six. He's on six life, and uh, he's facing down an active Hazard. And, of course, uh, Yam Wing Chun putting himself in a great position. I tell you what, I stood behind him when he, uh, he uh, snagged himself the top eight berth. Overcome with emotion he was. It was such a, such a heartfelt and touching moment to see this young man uh, having, you know, such a huge level of success at the highest, uh, highest stage of the game here. Ooh, so that's a really slow way to potentially deal with the Hazard at the Fervent. All right. The If near Deadlands, mm -hmm. if, you, if you sacrifice lands and utilize the ability, you can put two minus two minus two counters on a creature. If you sack two deserts, you could deal with the Hazard. Four minus one minus one counters uh, yeah. uh, across two different <laughs> deserts. So that, but that is, that is hugely relevant, Paul, because even one of them is going to shrink down Hazard. Right, of course. So Shintaro opting to get in there with the Amid Eternal and Yamun Chun deciding whether or not he wants to block with the Kenra. And one important thing here is, you know, if he blocks, the Amid Eternal maintains, uh, stays as uh, stays a 4-4. Four -four. But uh, more importantly, if Yamun Chun blocks, draws a land, he can eternalize mm -hmm. the Airshaker Kenra and get in for lethal damage. That's going to be key here as we see uh, Curata still get in for three. The Amid Eternal does have a flicked three, of course, so that's very, very relevant to remember. And Curata's not going to forget about that. He's got a sharp mind, he's got a sharp outfit, and he has come to uh, make a name for himself here. And I've been such, so impressed with what I've seen of him as a player throughout this weekend as well. Yeah, absolutely. Ships the turn over to Yam Wing Chun, who uh, right. is firmly ahead in this game. Definitely. He need, look, removal spell does it. Land does it. 
So let's have a, a look. A lot of outs. A lot of live draws here as yeah. We just look at him go. Jeez. Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, this is great. This open, is great. It's like when you open the booster. And that, was that an incendiary flow? Let's have a look. He's really playing it close to his chest. We're going to get that updated as quick as possible as we look now. And it, it was. It's an incendiary flow off the and top. And it was. Paul Eagle Eyes Cheon. Absolutely ready. Yeah, to you go got here. you got to just use it on the Bowman Courier here, and then you just get in for five, and then you can discard a card, and that's two damage. You, right now, Yam is currently just trying to figure out what cards can Shintaro have here, but there aren't a whole lot of instant speed ways to deal with the Hazard at the Fervent outside of Grasp of Darkness. But Yam should know his deckless; he doesn't have that. Is he shipping? No, 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 no. no, no, no. no. Oh, that was that, that motion. That's really five. That's one. Scared. Discard a card. Discard a card. Get your Hazard. Boom. Discard Hisk, uh, to Hazard and Curata goes down to Yam Wing Chun. This guy masterfully navigating his way through the first game here and uh, a small smile on his face, Paul Cheon, <laughs> because this guy has, uh, has really, really done a, a super good job throughout the entire um, tournament. And here now, up a game in our first, oh, sorry, our second quarterfinal. We've got plenty more magic coming your way, my friends. Stick around because on the other side of this, we'll be back with game number two. And after that, of course, our sideboarded games. Don't go anywhere. We'll see you back here in the feature match area in just a few moments. Represent your country at the World Magic Cup at national events. This September, you can compete against your country's best players for the title of national champion. You need Planeswalker points to participate, so keep playing in local events to qualify. Learn about qualifying for nationals at magic.wizards.com nationals. Hascon is happening September 8th through 10th in Providence, Rhode Island. Hascon will be hosting a Magic the Gathering Iconic Masters release event, 25th anniversary drafts, magic spell slinging, and all your favorites from the world of Hasbro. Join the family. Hascon tickets on sale now.
Welcome back to the Feature Match area here at Pro Tour Hour of Devastation. What a pleasure it is to have your company. My name's Riley and I'm uh, joined, of course, by Paul Cheon, the big boy himself. He's in here, ready to get amongst it with our uh, second game here for our second quarterfinals. We've already seen Yam uh, Wing Chun get up in game number one. And now it is on Shut uh, Shintaro Kurata to try to equalise things as the, before the players hit their sideboards. Now, Paul... Ordinarily, game two of Magic, of course, players already get the opportunity to sideboard. Things a little bit different in the finals. Yeah, in the in in the uh, in the top eight of this tournament, we both we to kind of lower you know lower the impact a little bit of the people going first and sideboards. We do get to play two game once mm -hmm. or three two pre-boarded games, followed by uh, potentially up to three more games uh, uh, post-board. We're going up to game of, uh, best of five essentially. And, right, exactly. And this, I mean, there are there are a range of benefits from this. You know, you can talk about stuff like variance. You can talk about stuff like play draw. Biggest benefit for us right now is we get to see more magic. And, like, that's, I mean, a Sunday at a, at a, at a PT, there aren't too many uh, stages where there is a high, a higher forms of the game. We've already seen uh, incredible stuff throughout the morning, and uh, it's expected to continue. Right. And uh, finally, we got to see Hazard the Fervent. Yeah, let's talk about this. Thing. Uh, I mean, you know, you can check back in with uh, with the first quarterfinal where we saw a mono red mirror and uh, Hazard the Fervent named as one of the key cards in the matchup. We didn't see her really having that much of an impact. Paul, how different uh, are things now that we've actually seen Hazard to do what she does best? Yeah, and I think this is kind of a similar play pattern. This is kind of what you kind of expect mm -hmm. when you're the first person to play that Hazard and attack. And Yam Wing Chun had some really timely draws there, needed to find the land to be able to play that hazard because he had two in his hand. If he didn't find land, he wouldn't have been able to attack with four, uh, sorry, attack for five mm. on turn four, or turn five rather. And uh, we saw how not being able to attack is just you know c the complete difference between winning and losing as Seth Manfield played a hazard earlier, but couldn't attack yeah. the first time. Yeah, and that, and that, was, that was key. Yeah. That was critical there, as we see now. Yam checking out this card, uh, his, his hand, and after... A few theatrics. He's uh, he's going to keep them. He, he, he does wear his hard lip. Hey, we want to see it too. We want to see it too. This guy. This guy. He's. The, I reckon this guy, dead set. He, he's the guy who opens a booster and like does the thing where he tries to guess the rare based on the collector's number and that sort of thing. Right. One hundred percent. There we go. But we're off to the races. These guys are underway now with our second game between Yam Wing Chun and Shin uh, Shintaro Kurata here. So I want to touch on something that I talked about earlier. The cost of playing. A second color in mm -hmm. your in your red deck. Karata has Mountain Bowmat Courier, Earthshaker Kenra, Smoldering Martian Mountain, and opted not to play Mountain to play the Bowmat Courier because he really wanted to play a two drop with in, in Kari Zef. The Ramanap red deck would never have that problem. No, they just run it out one drop, two drop, three drop, whatever. But uh, Bowmat Courier right. still still uh, languishing away in the hands of Kurata. Although he's off to a great start now with Kari Zev. Kurata is uh, got to be happy with that, attacking for three on turn three, unless there's some sort of uh, shenanigans or chicanery that Yam can do to uh, to stop that. Yeah, again, I think the mana works out, but it's de definitely not free because lands can come into play tapped. Now, does Yo. Yam have a removal effect? It doesn't look like it as he... Uh, just all he did was play a Bowmat Courier there, so this Kari Zev doing an impressive job on defense. He's got this <laughs> random upside. I mean, obviously you want to be attacking with Kari Zev and you want to get Ragavan up in the mix as well, but uh, she's got this random upside of just being a 1-3 first strike and can hold off a huge number of creatures. Right. Granted, Rami Nepred does have many two-mana answers to deal with a card like That's Kari true. Zev. Of course, you have uh, Incendiary Flow and a Braid, mm -hmm. but Yam Wing Chun's list, four copies of a Braid in the sideboard. So, not having that option right now, Yam Wing Chun is uh, going to have to find another way around the Skyship Captain. Uh, she's being joined by an Earthshaker Kenra here. Going to falter that Bomat Courier. And an attack. So, we're going to see the old Rag Ragavan Arena come in and get in for two. A shock means that Earthshaker Kenra is not going to correct. But still, Ragavan the Monkey, in addition to Kari Zev, the Skyship Raider, they're getting in for some points. Oh, and Shintaro Kurata missed his third land drop. Oh, dear. What are you... <laughs> All he loves to do is slow roll himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's really getting the maximum. Is it a burn spell? <laughs> <laughs> he's really loving it. Sun Scorch Desert comes down and dings uh, Kurata here for one. Uncrowned Crasher here would be great, and uh, yeah, great it is. Go. So we're seeing uh, Yam Wing Chun here get in for a bunch of damage 
in addition to tapping his lands in a different direction to his uh, his creatures, which is highly <laughs> perplexing, but all the same, it's still getting the job done. Anyway, you slice it, uh, Kurata, really under pressure here. Yeah, he's. I think I think instead of testing for this matchup, he just was trying to come up with creative ways to uh, to kind of just mildly <laughs> kills us in the booth. Yeah, and he's doing a great job. I mean, he's really firing uh, at all cylinders. He's yeah. uh, he's getting people up and about. In addition, of course, to really putting Kurata in a, in a tricky position here, and uh, we've seen Kurata have some uh, some sort of nascent mana issues. And and Paul Cheon, this could mean that he uh, is uh, beginning to go down with the ship. Yeah, and Karata still unable to find his third land here. All he can do is just play out a couple of creatures and pass. Back to uh, to Yam here. He's going to uh, once again slow roll the world with this uh, uh, with this draw. Slow. You know, I, I like I like a good slow roll when it's like actually kind of you know important. But every turn is just a little too much for me. This reminds <laughs> me of the <laughs> Miracles era Reed Duke Jund list where he would treat. Every card he drew, like it was a bonfire of the damned. Well, to, uh, to be fair, at least there's a good reason to do that. But just watching his <laughs> opponent sweat while that was happening, it was it was just glorious. Uh, but uh, no, Yam Wing Chun certainly getting maximum value out of those uh, out of those draw steps and really keeping us all, in, himself included, in the dark here. Yeah. So he's got a couple of options here. He can either opt to play the Earthshaker Kenra and attack with the squad, or use an Incendiary Flow to remove this Kari Zev. Two mana now, and it's going to be an incendiary flow, just like you said, Paul Cheon. And now he's likely going to attack with the team, making it so that the Falcon Wrath Gorger can't block so that the on crop crasher can safely attack and not die. Considering those very attacks now, as he lines up some of the probable blocks here that Kira Kirata might be looking to make. Yeah, I, if, if, if Yam attacks here, he's most definitely going to exert here. He doesn't want to just trade off his on crop crasher for the Falcon Wrath Gorger. So yeah, attacking with everything, exert, makes sense. Bowmat Courier trigger. So a lot of things happening here as Yam Wing Chun expertly navigates his way through this combat step, not forgetting a trick. Yeah, and Shintaro just now has to decide, do I not want to give Yam the cards or do I just want to pre preserve my life total? And looks like he's opting to preserve his life total. So on the block here now with the Bowmat Courier. Not exactly sure how this guy gets around. He's got like 10 spindly legs, but then it's some kind of gyroscope ball mechanism to go around. I guess just all terrain, all terrain vehicle, really. Yeah. Just the old ATV. Going to get that, uh, going to get those uh, Christmas presents delivered one way or another. It's, it's the future. Yeah. <laughs> it's an exciting time to live in. Don't know where our hoverboards are, but at least we've got the Bomat Courier. Back to Kurata now. Yeah. So, yeah, Kurata's got to feel a little bit of a reprieve here as the Oncrap Crasher is exerted. Yam Wing Chun, though, holding. Has the Fervent once again in his hand, and here, probably going to slow roll himself again, because if he finds land, he can play Hazret and attack for five. Bermat Courier. Here we go. Untaps. Will Untaps he find a land here? Not. Land, yep. Check. Oh, no, you ruined the slow you roll. Ruined it's Carrie it? Zev. It's Carrie Zev, Skyship <laughs> Raider off the top. Oh, no, just right. got a glimpse of the card there, but, uh, yeah, the old slow roll did not work out for, uh, for him this time. Yeah, but Kishintaro Karada still missing on his third land drop here. Yam Wing Chun can't... Uh, shaking his head, but I think he's in a totally fine situation. He can just play the Earthshaker Kenra, make it so that the Karizev can't block, get in for three points of damage, and then the next turn, On Crop Crasher gets to untap. So this will get Shintara down to six, and the On Crop Crasher, that's six power on the following turn. Couple of options for Yam Wing Chun uh, right now. He's going to go with uh, what looks like the Earthshaker Kenra. Yeah. Hold that Skyship Raider back for the time being. And this is going to poke through some extra points of damage here past the opposing carry Zev here from and he Kurata. Can get, and he can get a lot of value off that Bowmat Courier too because next turn, that's four cards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Shintara really needs to find a third land. Has he managed to do that here? Doesn't look as though he has, or he could be on the slow roll as well. Yeah, even if he does, he's still in a really tough spot because Yam Wing Chun, in that scenario that I always call consider kind of the dream scenario, okay. land or spell, great. Yeah, yeah, that's right? it. I mean, and the red deck puts itself in this position so often, Paul Cheon. Absolutely. Raminap Ruins, Hazard the Fervent. It means that you're drawing, uh, you know, uh, just a uh, rock solid hits regardless of uh, the way it goes. Yeah, you never run out of gas. Incendiary Flow here. Okay, so that was a good turn. Shintaro got to find his third land here and had the removal effect for the on-crop crasher. But again, if Yam Wing Chun still finds a land here, he's going to be very, very far ahead. Despite being punished for that slow roll last time, he's still going for it, and he's really giving us a, a hard land? time here. Is it a land? It it's is. a land! Ramming up ruins. That's going to turn things around here. Hazard the Fervent's going to come out to play. 
There Back it is. by Five says, Mum, but right now this indestructible haste god is going to have a huge impact on this game, Paul Cheon. Right. I, th I think he's probably just going to attack with the Hazaret. That would be my guess. And it's going to eat a creature here. Shintaro can't afford to go down to four life. Kurata, under a lot of pressure after Hazaret the Fervent has come down and does what she does best. And we will see the Falcon Wrath Gorgia on the Chumperino here. Yeah. Again, Kurata does not have an answer in his main deck to deal with the Hazard. He, the only thing he can hope to do is just be faster, but uh, being stuck on two lands, he just really hasn't been able to develop a board or empty out his hand. No, that's right. He's stuck on two lands for quite a while. He has managed to continue to, to add to the board now. I mean, he drew a Swamp last turn, and this Amid Eternal has come down now, but... Uh, the all the same, it's it's not been good stuff from Karata. He hasn't been able to hit his marks, and, and Yam Wing Chun has definitely capitalized on that. Yeah. The best answer to a Hazret is your own Hazret to block with. Then you then you get in this weird limbo where mm -hmm. basically uh, whoever's at a lower life total ends up losing because you're just both discarding cards yep. furiously just to get your opponent down. Just the big Clint Eastwood, this town ain't big enough for the both of us at either end of the uh, either end of the street, no one wanting to attack and just hoping that they can find the mark. But uh, I want to touch upon this again, Paul Cheon. Maybe we'll have time to discuss the fact that the red deck and its late game is what has really pushed this deck over the top of the Pro Tour. The fact that it's got so many live draws as Hazard gets in again uh, and, and, you know, has built-in flood protection, cards like Earthshaker, Kenra, Ramianap Ruins, and Hazard the Fervent. This red deck's got what it takes. Yeah. One thing uh, Yan Wing Chun could have considered doing too, if he really wanted to fill up his hand, I don't know if he wants to because he has the Hazard in play, but he could have also just like played the card he's have, attack with the Bomat Courier and the Hazaret, and then, you know, uh, he, he's empty handed, but he did get the attack in, tr get the Bomat Courier up to four cards, then sacrifice it to try to find more burn spells to try to finish off Shintaro, because, uh, you know, he's already down to nine life. And given that you're a Ramunap Red deck, even if you draw four cards, you're, you can pretty easily get rid of those cards in your hand. Funny how uh, drawing four cards is something of a liability sometimes. Like, do I really want to draw oh. four cards? I got this Hazaret. Yeah. But now he's... Kind of riches, yeah. and that's the thing. Look at the situation now. Now he's thinking about whether or not he wants to stack that Bowmat Courier. He could have just attacked and gotten an extra card if he really wanted to. Kurata weighing up his options. His hand isn't looking too bad, but he just doesn't have the fuel he needs to, uh, to add to the fire. Yeah, there's just it's, he's just way too far behind on board here. So Yam Wing Chun, he is hellbent. He does have the option to uh, add to his hand with that Bomat, Bomat Courier. Excuse me. But he's going to need to find a way to uh, to close the door in this game, although it, it shouldn't be too difficult for him here. Yeah, and again, look, this is just a common situation that you see as the Raminap Red deck. Look, Yam Wing Chun can draw a bunch of cards. He can sacrifice deserts. He can discard cards to continue to chip away at Chintaro Karada's life total. Mm, yeah, he's just, just got to just just never get flooded. Covered. Yep, he's just zipping and zapping around. He's covered all the exits, and he's looking to really... Uh, put Kurata in a position where he can't maneuver his way out of it. Yeah. Solskar Mage. And no further plays here for Kurata, who is whose hand is a little bit of in a little bit of a glut here. Yeah, so Kurata could have opted to just play a bigger creature, but I think he might want to just he, maybe he's thinking to himself, the way I get back from this is like to try to bluff a burn spell. This Down is so now this is like a little. This is a little bit risky. If some something really weird happens, like he draws like two hazards or something. Well, but uh, land, land, un uncrop crasher was the draw from the Bomat Courier. So that Yan should Wing seal Chun, the deal. It reload. He reloads here, and is this going to be enough here, Paul Chion? Oh, <laughs> along with an Earthshaker Kenra. Ooh. Wow. So we can go land crasher Kenra. Both creatures can't block. Take. Millions. Yeah, at least <laughs> at least one or two million damage is going to come through from Yam Wing Chun's team here. That's 15 damage. These He's going to deal falter, 15 damage this turn. These falter effects are just hugely decisive here as we see Yam Wing Chun. In comes the Yarn Crop Crasher. Down comes the... Well, not even any need for that as Shintaro Kurata recognizes the writing on the wall. He's been listening to OK Go all afternoon and he recognizes the fact that uh, Yam Wing Chun has locked it up and is now at one... Game, one game, Paul Cheon, <laughs> away from a, a semi-final berth. Yeah, but we've seen this situation before, and we saw one of the, probably one of the biggest comebacks in PT Top 8 history. Yeah. Oh. And uh, so, you know, never count somebody out. One for the ages. If you didn't get across our coverage earlier this morning when Paula Vita Damodorosa took apart Seth Manfield after being down 0-2 uh, 
uh, pre-sideboard. It's definitely absolute uh, uh, gold standard viewing. So we d recommend you get across that. Of course, plenty more action coming your way from Kyoto, Japan. It's been a great pleasure to have you company. Ch thank you for choosing to join us, Riley Knight and Paul Cheon, in the booth. It's time for us to have a look at the sideboards of the two players on your screen. Uh, Yan Wing Chun, he'll be looking to uh, make sure he capitalizes on this early advantage that he's got to zip up against his opponent. And uh, how are things going to look for him post-board, Paul? Uh, so Yan Wing Chun, if you look at his sideboard, he's got, again, what's a, a typical sideboard that you see in a lot of these red decks. You're trying to go a little bit bigger. So you have access to cards like Chandra Torch of Defiance, which helps you get ahead on cards. You have a, a Akum Firebird also, which, you know, if you're, it, you just have to keep using removal effects to get this off the board. And it's got the landfall effect. If you get up to six mana, you can just keep returning this back onto the battlefield. And then he's got a, a ton of different removal options here as well. I expect him to likely bring in an extra copy of the Scavenger Grounds just to have an extra land because he's probably going to bring in, be bringing in those four drops, possibly the Abrade just for remo more removal, and possibly even the Magma Spray. It really depends on how much of a controlling role he wants to take. On the draw, often, you board out a lot of your cheap creatures for the removal. Now, Warping Whale's a curious one for me as well. It seems to be pretty live against a lot of the cards in his opponent's deck, a lot of uh, creatures with power or, or toughness one. But, I mean, is this where you want to be? Because you're all basically always trading down on mana. Yeah, yeah. B because, of, because of that fact, I don't think you would want something like a Warping Whale. You already have a lot of efficient removal. Mm -hmm. You have access to Shock. You have Magma Spray. You have a Braid. So I highly doubt he's going to be bringing in the Warping Whale because, look, he's, he's already just got a ton of options here. Yeah, a bit of a curious one there. We'll have to keep an eye on, thing, on that card moving forward. But uh, let's see what our, uh, our our friend uh, Shintaro Kurata has to has brought to bear here as well. He's got some Eldrazi cards of his own, but uh, what, what what's your uh, eye drawn to here, Paul Chown? Well, he's got uh, something that Seth Manfield also had in the fourth copy of Hazard the Fervent. But again, you know, if you look, he's got a ton of four drops he's going to be bringing in. He's, there's two Chandras, two Akum Firebirds, and a Hazaret. I, I don't know, like, is, is the fourth hazard something that you want in your sideboard if you're also bringing in all these other four drops? You know, he's also got the glory bringers, he's got the additional, he's got the additional lands that I imagine he's bringing in, and he even has two copies of Blazing Volley, which has got to be specifically for the mirror. Um, I guess it could have some function against the Catcher's Monument deck, but um, he might want to bring that in as well. But the thing is, he's on the play this time around. And if he thinks that Yam is going to be on a more defensive build after Cyborg, Blazing Volley might not actually even be that great. So we'll have to see the way that these guys choose to configure their decks. And, and, and this is something we've touched upon already in our coverage of this event, Paul Chi, on the fact that these red decks, uh, and in saying that, I'm including this black red deck as well, these decks uh, are able to position themselves in, in, in different ways. And we see it looks like Wing Chun Yam has, has already drawn himself up uh, a, a little <laughs> sideboard plan there that he's going to refer to. But, yeah. Paul, one thing that these decks can do is they can sort of adopt a different position. They can kind of pivot to become bigger, to become uh, sort of more, not late game decks, but definitely go bigger and, and, uh, and stronger, have higher impact cards, take out these 1-1s one for one and, and put in stuff like Glory Bringers. Do you expect that we're going to see a different texture to these games post sideboard? Uh, absolutely. You're going to see more removal, and uh, both players are likely going to cut some number of their cheap spells. Um, one notable, one thing to note is just that neither player has any copy of Chandra's defeat in their sideboard. Oh, geez. And I think, you know, when, when we talked to Paulo Vitor earlier in the day, he yeah. was saying, I want to play against any other mono red list yeah. because. I think I'm a huge favorite in those matchups. But Seth Manfield, it's going to be close because we have a lot of the same cards. You look at these, you know, neither player has, a, has really a, a great a answer to, you know, a result of Chandra Torch of Defiance. And we saw this, I mean, this harks back to, you know, Theros standard where we had Gainsay against the mono blue decks where this card was just bonkers. It was just a two-mana straight-up counterspell in right. standard. And um, uh, so much of the work that uh, the Chandra's Defeat does in these in these sort of mono red mirrors, again, even though we do have a black red aggro deck on your screen, Chandra's Defiance would still be just excellent against so many of the cards in, the, in that we're going to see do battle here. Yeah, I mean, it just reads one red, kill basically every permanent that your opponent has. Yeah, that's it's it. It's just such a powerful effect. And again, with kind of standard moving forward, I can't imagine people not playing two to three copies of this, uh, of this card in their sideboard, at the very least, yeah, if you're playing sure. red. Not, not even in just mono red, if you're just playing red. If you're playing red, you want to... I mean, the fact that you've got access to it is, is, is going to give you a huge boon against this uh, deck. I mean, I expect fully moving on from this tournament, it's going to have a big target painted on its head. You're going to need to be ready for it. But in a way, that lessens the impact that it's going to have if people are prepared, putting up walls, uh, uh, enabling ways to, to defend against this red onslaught. Uh, it's going to be an interesting future for this deck. Oh, absolutely. You know, the common thing in, when a format is kind of new and fresh mm. um, is that aggressive decks tend to do well because people don't really know what 
strategies are best. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know what? I'm just going to attack because people might not be ready for just just how streamlined, how powerful the aggressive strategies are because they do kind of build itself a little more than a lot of the other mid-range control strategies. That's a good point. And I think the, the big challenge in, in in building a control deck in an unexplored uh, format is the fact that you don't know what questions you're going to need to answer. Right. Mono red's always a good choice at the at the uh, outset of a format at its, at its inception because its game plan is relatively straightforward and, and doesn't require too many, uh, you know, trist. Uh, twists or tricks or, or, or turns. Right. Whereas if you're trying to build a you know a, a big control deck, you need to know what you're up against. You need to know what sort of stuff you're you're going to need to uh, to bring down. And as I say, at the inception of a format, you don't know what questions you're going to need to answer. Right. And that's the thing. I think it's okay if the red deck is one of the best decks in the format because oftentimes. If you really want to beat the red deck, mm. you probably can't. Yeah, for sure. You, know, you just have to build your deck in, in, in a way uh, that you, uh, you know, life gain, cheap, efficient removal, yeah. cards like that. Uh, you know. I mean, the, the fact that this deck is is up and about. I, I, I'm a huge fan of the fact that we've got a, a really aggressive deck, and our top eight has got some. Uh, it's some been a while. Getting on the front, it has. I mean, it's I remember Martin Dang winning, it, winning in uh, a Pro Tour of Dragons of Tarkir with his Ataka Red deck, and uh, Yo I mean, Larson. Exactly right. Uh, we've had we've had this in the past where the the top eight has been dominated by aggressive decks, but uh, it looks like the other thing that this says to me, Paul Chion, is there's so much left to explore in this format. Absolutely. Because when we're being overrun with basic mountains. People are gonna people are gonna hit the brewski. People right. are gonna try to find ways to to go toe to toe with this deck, and and there are a wealth. We've got look at the card pool in stand at the right. moment. And again, there were a ton of players who kind of knew that red was gonna be popular, and that's why we saw such a high percentage of zombies being mm. represented at this tournament. There are ways to beat red if you wanted. Again, yesterday at, at the top tables, I saw a lot of zombies, lots of grasp of darknesses running yeah. around this just to be able to spot. fight uh, the the red decks. So these players, looking at their opening hands here and considering uh, what they're going to do, I mean, it looks like uh, Yam Wing Chun might be doing the old windscreen wiper trick on the uh, on the glasses here. <laughs> oh, I've been there. Fogging up a little bit. Yeah, and uh, Kurata, uh, his hand, you know, he's got a lot of powerful cards, but his hand's really, really slow. He's got, um, he's got Chandra, he's got the Firebird, and a Glorybringer, but he doesn't have a lot of cheap interaction. Fortunately, this he's on the play, so he you know he might it might be okay for him to keep it. But uh, you know, a hand like this on the draw, you know, you you like it might be a little too risky to keep. You're really behind the eight ball there, but uh, Kurata now he looks happy with his uh, uh, hand here. And look at this, the biggest of slow rolls, mountain, mountain, collective <laughs> defiance, shock, another mountain, Bomad Curia, and the last one, a sun scorched desert. Oh, a little bit flooded here, Paul Chian. Yeah, he is a little bit fl flooded, but he does have a card that helps prevent flood in the Collected Defiance. You draw too many lands, you can just discard your hand and uh, and uh, just kind of uh, refill, throw away your lands for, for better spells. Looks like he's happy with it. Shintaro Kurata and Yam Wing Chun going at it for our third game here, our first post-sideboard game as Bomad Curia gets in and uh, already snags a card off the top of the library. And Kurata really needs to find some lands here. He kept the two lander with the Nurse Shaker Kenra, but he, oh. There's a Mismatch Mountain, There's Riley. a Mismatch Mountain as well, yes. I've got a close eye on that, but uh, we do have this Earthshaker Kenry getting in for two. Kurata is uh, looking to uh, get on the front foot and, and, and take his opponent to school here. And I have to say something, uh, you know, sort of outside the game that's really impressed me about Shintaro Kurata is just his demeanor. His demeanor yeah. and his attitude seems to be very serious, a very earnest, and a, and a, and a very uh, uh, well-put-together player here. And I've been really impressed with the way he's carried himself. Yeah, just cool, calm, and collected. He doesn't really, you know, he hasn't really shown that he's, you know, at all frustrated despite just mm -hmm. being down two matches. Yep, and we see all we can see players of all stripes in the feature match area. And uh, thinking back to yesterday where John Finkel took apart uh, Frank Carsten limb by limb and Frank still walked out with a smile in his face. And I love seeing this sort of stuff, but Curata's, he's just his composition and he's just disposition. It really, really impressed me. I'm, I'm really I'm really drawn to Magic players like this. So Yam yeah, being on the draw here, opting to uh, play it a little more defensive here. Did not attack with the Bomat Courier because he wants to be able to trade it off with the Earthshaker Kenra. He also has access to Shock if Shintaro decides to play um, some other haste creature here. Uh, we know that he can't play an Oncrop Crasher though because that is not in his 75. So both players now at a bit of a deadlock here. Yeah. yeah. Both of them looking to maybe uh, push things into the late game. We see Kurata with a, uh, a hand that, as you mentioned, Paul Cheon, is set up 
to uh, to push forward into the later stages of the game. Four drops and five drops abound. In addition to a collective brutality, that's a nice one as well. Yeah, it is nice. He doesn't have the black mana again. Kind of the cost of being two colors, uh, and um, you know, Karada's hand is definitely set up for the late game though. Yam Wing Chun, firing off a shock here to take care of that Kenra. Right, but you know, if you're if you're Karada, you got to be thrilled. He needed to find lands, and he drew back-to-back -back lands, which is going to allow him to cast some of his bigger, yeah, uh, bigger he, spells. He's done well. We've got Chandra on the horizon here, looming for Kurata as this Bomat Courier gets in for another one here. See the mountain in hand ready to fire off the four drop. Could be the Akum Firebird as well if he's looking to take a more aggressive posture. What are you looking at here, Paul? Yeah, this, this is kind of interesting. He, he, he can offer either. One really important thing to note here is that he knows Yam does not have access to Chandra's defeat. That's big. That's a huge amount of information, actually. I mean, we, we talked about this already, Paul, but it's worth mentioning again that both of these players, they are fully across each other's deck lists. They've been given copies of them, so they know what to expect. Running out your Chandra into open mana can be something of a liability at so many points, but right now and right here, Shintaro Kurata knows that this Chandra is going to stick around at least for the time being. Exactly, and uh, another big thing here is that Yan Wing Chun has a ton of cards in hand. He can't just drop a Hazret next turn and attack the Chandra. So Karada opting to go for the Chandra here, turn four. What will he do with the plus effect? It looks like he's just opting to deal two damage here. He's not able to cast <laughs> anything that would be exiled, so Yam Wing Chun takes a bit of a, uh, a slap upside the head here from the Torch of Defiance. Now, he's got some interesting options in his hand, one of which, of course, is Collective Defiance. This is not a card that has sort of headlined the tournament by any stretch. Still a lot of utility to this Escalade card, though. Yeah, but you know, there's, there's not a ton of great direct damage burn effects, and this is just another one to kind of add. It's a little more expensive, but it does give you, you know, kind of, again, a little bit of utility. Uh, if you spend four mana, you're getting a lot of damage. You're getting a lot of damage, being able to deal damage damage to both creatures and players. Yeah. yeah, the first mode, the sort of hidden mode, the secret mode, we don't see too much, but the fact that it can go downstairs or upstairs, a key piece of interaction for some of these red decks, and it looks like Yam is really ready to, uh, to bring that to bear here. Yeah. Magma spray in his hand, in addition to that Hazard the Fervent. And look at that, we've got the, uh, we've got the Italian Alps sitting in his hand, three mountains here. Yeah, really, really slow hand here. And, you know, he, I, I think if, if, if he, given the choice, he, he really would have just preferred to be able to just discard some of those lands because he really wants that Hazret to be online. But, you know, this... Mercurio comes and tickles Chandra down to, down to four here. Yeah. He's probably going to go for a collective... Oh, no, he's opting to just run out the Hazret here and try to empty out his hand next turn. So Hazret the Fervent, four cards in hand, not where you want to be with this god. And uh, given that a couple of them are lands, he might have some difficulty... Uh, liquidating his hand-based assets at this stage. Yeah. So, Corrado looking reasonable here. He's got some pretty big threats. That Hazret's not really going to be able to attack anytime soon. Uh, let's see. Yam can actually play, let's see, land, magma spray, collect the defiance, but he's also drawing a card for his turn. And Shintaro found the Black Source. One interesting thing here, though, is if he uses the Collective Brutality to actually make Yam Wing Chun discard a card, that just puts Yam closer to be able to attack with the Hazaret. So that's I'm not sure if he actually wants to do that. That's a great point. That's a funny little piece of interaction here. We've seen a couple of times the fact that the Red Deck, it wants to be Hellbent. It wants to have no cards in hand, essentially, here. He could opt to just use Collective Brutality to get the Bomat Courier off the board. Yeah, for sure. Gain a little bit of life, perhaps, as well, if he's looking to cash in a card for a healing self type effect, as well as, of course, dinging Yam for a further two. But uh, Paul Cheon, I mean, the prediction you made about this game slowing down, this match, the texture of this match being very different after sideboard, it's definitely come true. We've seen more mid-rangey cards uh, coming to play here. And uh, Kurata, Kurata here, uh, discarding an Akum Firebird. He's hoping to get some value out of that card a bit later on. Yeah, I don't think Yam's actually too, too disappointed about that. He's like, yes, one less card in hand. Magma Spray, Mountain, Mountain, all that remains in Yam Wing Chun's hand after that collective defiance hits the bin. And, Ooh. geez, look at this follow-up play. We weren't expecting this. Chandra goes upstairs, two red mana from Curata, and Glorybringer, with all the glory to bring in the world, gets in for four Yam Wing Chun on the clock. Yeah, one thing I wanted to mention was, if the Glorybringer wasn't on the battlefield, Yam Wing Chun could have still opted to cast Magma Spray on the Hazard of the Fervent if he wanted a cheap way to kind of discard a card from his hand so that the Hazard could go in and attack the Chandra. What? He needs something big here. Well, but we're going to we're gonna have to uh, wait a, a little while to see what it is here as Yam Wing Chun 
Slow rolls everyone, including himself. It's another mountain. Okay. Look at that. So, so he's on a big hiking trip through Bavaria at the moment because all he's seeing are mountains. Yeah, so he can still put himself uh, to, down to one card. He can play a mountain. He can cast Magma Spray on the Glorybringer, discard a card to deal two damage to Shintaro Kurata, and then use the Hazret to finish off the Chandra. I imagine that's what he's looking to do here. Um, and then it's just a race of, of Glorybringer versus uh, Hazret the Fervent. But Shintaro Kurata has a Hazard the Fervent of his own in his hand. And this can change the game completely here. We've talked about this card being key, and it's always nice when things line up and, uh, and demonstrate that now as we see Hazard begin to pressure. I would assume Chandra here. Yeah, well, he, so he's, yeah, he's going to deal two damage to get Sh Shintara down to 15, and then Hazard will just, yeah, finish off the sh uh, Chandra by attacking. He should use the Magma Spray here on just a random creature just to get down to one card, which I imagine that's what he's going to do. So Magma Spray essentially just being discarded here for, for, for no real value other than the fact that it turns Hazard online. Right, right. So Magma Spray, he will target it for, for the full <laughs> style points. Get a little he will fancy. target his own creature. Yeah. I'm a very big fan of that. Like a hearty it. congratulations to Yam Wing Chun, a gentleman of true taste and refinement, as he uh, uh, stitches together a, a turn that really, uh, you know, went pretty well there. Yeah, but again, shintaro has got a Hazard here. That's nine damage. That's going to get Yam Wing Chun down to three life this turn. Those are some big hits here, and yep. Kurata looking to really turn the uh, corner on this game. Getcha, he says. Getcha. Stick this in your pipe and smoke it, my friend, he says. And it's back to Yam Wing Chun on three life. He's got to find an answer. Active Hazard online for him. Checks in with the top card of his library, and that it's Incendiary Flow. How's that looking? That's not going to get it done. The most damage Yam can muster here is three damage from the Incendiary Flow, two damage, discard a land. He's going to target himself. Full style points. <laughs> there we go. He's popped on the later hose, and he's gone off for a hike ac across the, uh, the Alps here. And at the end of it, after being a little bit flooded out, having to point a burn spell at himself, and I'm really impressed by that, of course. But even more impressed by the fact that, of course, Shintaro Kura Kurata has got himself a game four. He's poisoned a knife edge, Paul Chan. He can't afford to pick up another loss. Are we going to see another 2-0 comeback here? I mean, it's certainly within the cards, but of course, Yam's yeah, still uh, a pretty big favorite here. He gets to go first now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just kind of looking at their cyber configurations, it's going to be pretty close. I mean, Shatara does have a few more top-end cards uh, in, in the matchup, but, you know, play draw, I think, is, is really, really important here. And if Yam just drops the hazard at the Fervent first, he, that can just take over the game. We've already seen that, of, hap of course, happen in, in our earlier games before the, uh, the, the players sideboarded. Hazard at the Fervent, a key card in this matchup. There's plenty of key cards for us to get across here, Paul. We might have a look at, uh, at some of the, uh, those uh, further on down in the track as, as things continue here. We'll have a look at exactly what these players are going to bring to bear in the post-sideboard games. Let's have a look at some of the cards. Maybe, maybe Curata here might have uh, an interesting one or two to bring to bear. And uh, Cut to Ribbon certainly one that's going to be high on our radars moving forward, Paul Cheon. And uh, a card that, uh, again, hasn't headlined, but certainly plays a role in this matchup. Yeah, yeah, we kind of touched on it before. And it's kind of interesting because it, like, Shintaro already has access to a ton of removal in the matchup. He's got the shocks, he's got the flows, the brutalities, and even a braid out of the sideboard. And it's even possible he might look to uh, shave on a couple of these because it's a sorcery speed removal effect. Well, but let's see what else he might be able to bring to bear here. Of course, Amit Eternal, the big heavy hitter in his uh, his list. I mean, this this card is uh, uh, doesn't muck around. Although we mentioned not at its best in in the red matchup. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely much better in uh, in your matchups against kind of the slower decks. Red decks can just play out a few creatures to shrink this to the point where it might actually not just be relevant. But still, at the end of the day, we're talking about a three mana five five. Mm. This card just crunches in for a ton of damage. It can really steal games. I mean, again, as it says there, a, a much larger body. It's, it, it is a way, way above cost. And if you're on the play, if you can uh, get this down early, sometimes you're just going to, yeah, as you say, slap him about with a 5-5, and that's going to get the job done sometimes. But uh, it's not always the way it goes. But some other black cards to keep an eye on here, Paul Chen. What do you think about Collective Brutality? We saw it do some good work just now. Yeah, in a racing situation, this is really nice. Uh, you know, in the mirror... It does give you the ability to pretty much get any creature early on. You can also use the drain effect, which is nice. Mm. And 
uh, not irrelevant, you can also use this to discard cards, which means you have a much higher chance of being able to play a Hazard the Fervent on turn four and get it to connect. Yeah, this card, I mean, we've seen it do a real number on modern. It's it, it's played in the main decks of many of these uh, of, of, of black-based modern decks, and, and it is a very, very powerful option against burn in modern. And, and you know, there's obviously a, not too much of a parallel to be drawn between the, the, the hyper-efficiency of the burn deck in modern and, and this deck in standard, but they've got the same game plan, get you from 20 to zero as, uh, as fast as you can. And uh, Collective Brutality is a nice stumbling block for that. Yeah, absolutely. It just looks like, you know, the fir especially in this matchup, with the lack of uh, Chandra's defeats, it it's really mostly about kind of the heavy hitters in the matchup. You have the Chandra Torch of Defiance. You have the Firebirds. You have the Hazret the Fervent. You have the Glorybringers. Those are very important. Although Chandra Torch of the... F uh, sorry, um, the Akum Firebird might be Mirror Tech. Doesn't seem especially great because both players do have access to Incendiary Flow, That's which true. does permanently exile It's the bird. so, so good against Blue-Red Control. It's so good against these decks that don't have a permanent answer to it. It just keeps coming back and back and back. And, I mean, that, that could be the reason for it here. Yeah, although it seems like th these decks are already very well positioned against those decks so it might not even be necessary there yeah well we'll see we'll see if it's brought to bear in uh, in game number four here between these two players uh, a couple of other cards to keep an eye on here paul chion maybe we can have a look at uh, at what else we uh, we're gonna have high on our radar and i mean is there a card higher on anyone's radar right now than ramunap ruins yeah this card again just makes it so that you're never gonna flat out and you're gonna just be your it just gives the deck so much reach and it's it almost totally free Right? You're yeah. all, it just taps for red mana. You're the aggressive that you don't really care if you take damage from this land unless you're just playing the mirror. Well, I mean, another card we need to talk about when we're talking about this Ramanap Red deck, the, the marquee card of the deck, I would say, apart from the Ruins, is, of course, Hazard the Fervent. She is just an absolute house. I mean, yeah. she's the real deal. Th this card is... is it does everything you want. It attacks, it blocks. I mean, well, maybe not. you're not wanting to block so much. Definitely attacks and attacks and attacks and just... You can rip cards off the top of your library. You don't even care what they are if all you want to be doing is two damage to your opponent. Yeah, it really kind of makes me wonder why this didn't see more play in the past because uh, th this is definitely the most impressive of the gods that you know I've seen people try to play. And mm -hmm. it's just so, so difficult to deal with. So, like, it, look, just look at the stats on this card. If you can attack with this on turn four, it's so brutal. Yeah. It's so, so brutal. And so much of the time, this red deck is able to empty its hand out. It is able to uh, to get in for five on turn number four, which is which is just so key in, in, in turning the corner on a, on a matchup here. But it's not the only hasty threat that we find in the red decks here because, of course, uh, one of the ones, and one of the cards of the tournament for me has to be Earthshaker Kendra. This guy, you know, not the sort of uh, the headline player. He's not really the, you know, the, the LeBron James, but he's certainly, <laughs> he's still sitting there. He's, you know, he's ready to be put in and, and get amongst it on turn number two. Poke through for some damage, clear some blocks lockers out of the way and then comes back again with that uh, with that last quarter. Yeah, that that eternalized effect is super relevant. I mean, I think the card by itself, just the two mana two one haste that allows you to get in for some damage so that your ramming up ruins and hazard the fervent can finish people off. That's already a pretty solid card. Mm. But this eternalize the eternalize on this just puts it right over the and top. And this is why he isn't the LeBron James because he does have the fourth quarter. This guy can come in as a four four, <laughs> clear some blockers out of the way, and again <laughs> get in for this uh, this late game damage. And 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 this is another piece of the puzzle, uh, Paul Chion, in the red deck going long. Right. Raminap Ruins, Hazard the Fervent, and Earthshaker Kenra. This trio essentially means that the, the red deck has, has just, it's gone out to the, the local insurance agency, slapped its money down on the counter, and said, I will have the top premium flood insurance quality uh, insurance that I can get off you, my, my friend. It really seems unfair that, yeah, you have this aggressive deck that also just has a fantastic late game. Well, let's see how things shake out now for game number four between Yamwing Chan and Shintaro Kurata. These guys uh, could be heading into the final game here. This is uh, Kurata's last chance to make sure he stays on top. Falcon Wrath Gorger opening things up here. Right, ideal start for Yam Wing Chun. And uh, I believe, again, he's got that Earthshaker Kenra. So really, really nice, fast start. But Shintaro does have the answer here. He's got a shock, which he will very likely use here, I imagine, on the uh, Falcon Wrath Gorger. Yes, indeed. Away it goes, doing its impression of a... Of, hey, oh, look at this. The old find the lady Hand game. Tricks. With, uh, which one? Which one? Yeah, which one? Nope, done. sorry, I switched it. It is the Earthshaker Kenra hmm. when all is said and done, and in comes the Gorger for two. It's an uh, interesting choice there on, yeah. uh, on, on the shock. It's going to be, it's mostly irrelevant, but again, the Earthshaker Kenra does have that eternalized effect, and they're both just two ones. Foreboding Ruins, revealing Mountain for the second time. Kurata not having any mana issues this time. He set himself up well to collective, defi uh, collective brutality, I should say, in hand. Looks like he's, got, he's uh, sitting on some, uh, 
some decent cards here. Yeah, yeah, and it, you know he's got he's got some reasonable options to discard. Falcon Wrath Gorger not especially strong right now, so he might opt to use the Collected Brutality to get the Gorger off the board and maybe take a card out of Yang Mung Chun's hand. I don't mind that. I think discarding the Gorger, which is going to be a pretty low impact card, Kurata's got what he needs to bridge himself to the late game. He's got a cut to ribbons. He's got this Collective Brutality, and I think he's going to lean hev more heavily on Glory Bringer than he is on the right. two one here. Yeah, and I definitely would like want to keep the cut to ribbons in hand because of cards like the Akun Firebird and of course you know. Uh, uh, Yang Wing Chun could also just play something like a Kari Zev or an Oncrop Crasher on turn three. Well, discarding a Swamp instead to get to, to chop out two of those uh, options here. It looks like we're going to have the Duress mode and in addition to the uh, minus two, minus two here. Disfigure Duress, essentially. Yeah. The little split card, get, uh, split card there from Collective Brutality. I love this card. I'm all yeah. about it. I will say the Collective Brutality, actually, I don't think it's at its best if you use the Duress effect, at least in the first games, but it does get better post-board because Yam Wing Chun does have access to four copies of a Braid, three copies of Magma Spray. But, uh, you know, game one, there's there's only just a handful of uh, burn spells. There's a decent chance you could miss with the card. Well, no Whiskey here for Kurata as he snags that... Uh, incendiary flow and it hits the bin in addition to the Falcon Wrath Gorgeous. So straight up two for two. Collective Brutality never doing anything too broken, but all the same, it can definitely push forward your game plan here. And Kurata, as we mentioned, looking to get into that late game. Here yeah. comes the Uncrop Crasher. Oh, he discarded Swamp. Mm, Interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's held on to that Falcon Wrath Gorgeous, which, you know, can block the Uncrop Crasher in theory. Yes. In practice, perhaps not so much. So I think the reason why he discarded the Swamp is it does allow him to double spell on, on this turn. Yeah, I like that. He, he gets to kind of put a threat on the board and use his cut, um, but it does put him further away from being able to cast the Glory Bringer. Just little Savannah Lions here, the Falcon Wrath Gorger. Almost always just a 2-1 for 1 here. Right, right, right. There are situations that uh, if the games get really drawn out where yep. you have two hazards facing off each other, if you do have one Gorger in play, you can start madnessing out other Gorgers yeah. with the discard ability. I haven't seen it happen yet, but it is a thing that you could do. There are whispers. <laughs> there are whispers, Paul Chan, on the overhead cables of this having happened. So, a block now with the Gorger. Wing, uh, Yan Wing Chun trading off his wow. Boma Courier here. Yan Wing Chun is hellbent. He has no cards in hand. And this is the point now where Kurata, Kurata can push himself forwards into this late game, lean on cards like Glory Bringer, Yan Wing Chun, with a, you know, an established board presence, but something that sort of pales in comparison to the cards that uh, Kurata is going to get to bring to bear. Already you can see a Bray Glory Bringer newly joined by an Eldrazi Obligator. This card got a bit of press moving into the Pro Tour, Paul Cheon. Hasn't performed. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's much better in a, in a field where... Uh, you ha you're playing against kind of the bigger decks, bigger green decks, and it gives you kind of the ability to kind of push through for a little more point, a few more points of damage. But I don't think it's especially strong in the mirror. A three mana three one, you, you just kind of get brick walled by all the one drops in the red deck. Not really, you know, kind of one of the cards you want in the matchup. Well, it's so I'm actually surprised that it's that it's still uh, in the in the deck after sideboarding. It's being run out here in any case, and it looks like we're just going to get a little one for one trade here. Right. I'll draw so the yeah. obligator. Not doing too much more <laughs> than a three uh, than uh, a three one haste here. So yeah. weird to see the haste as the last word on the card. Usually it's the first. Yeah, when your three drop gets you know trades with the one drop, it's not a great feeling. <laughs> so uh Remy Nap ruins off the top of Yam Wing Chun here as his options continue to dwindle. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, not not in a great spot in terms of resource. Ooh. Okay. And in an even worse wow. spot now, as we see, we uh, we're going to have a look at this card here. Amid Eternal is a three mana five five. Paul Cheon, you talked about the inherent Chandra would be a great. Oh. oh. Never mind. Hey, All wait, right. wait, wait, wait. I think I think you misclicked on the advantage. Let player. me just jump up <laughs> that uh, big plate of words that I was spewing yeah. out here because Hazareth the Fervent comes down, and all of a sudden, Yam Wing Chun jumps wow. back up. And it is left, right, good night here for Shintaro Kurata. He's got to find something very special now. I, I was gonna. I was talking about how Chandra would be a great draw. Totally forgot this card was in the deck. Hazrat the Fervent <laughs> has really brought to bear here. This is incredible wow. stuff from Yam Wing Chun. Ripped it off the top of his library like an absolute monster. And this 5-4 indestructible haste, she's really getting it done here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yam is... Yeah, he's cheering for his friends here, telling them to scream as loud as they can because he is moments away from moving on to the semifinals here because, again, Shintaro doesn't have an answer to Hazret. He needs to play his own just to block. Shintaro Kurata, he's sitting there. He's thinking, okay, I've got this. I can push this dragon in. I can get in this. I can do that. I can uh, 
you know, if, uh, I can uh, make some moves here, maneuver myself into a position, but uh, Yam Wing Chun has just got a big old spanner out the toolbox and chucked it straight into those works here. Yam Wing wow. Chun, poised now, poised. What a draw. Yeah, yeah Shintaro Karada has an abraid here, which you can use to get the Falcon Wrath Gorger off the board, attack for four, get Yam Wing Chun down to 16, but then, but then that's lethal, so... Because a card off the top, any card uh, that Yan Wing Chun draws is essentially a shock. Oh! And it's collected wow. the science off the top, and Yan Wing Chun takes it out. Three games to one, Shintaro Kurata. Nothing left for him to do. Two thumbs up. And his hand, and a huge smile on the face of Yan Wing Chun. This guy, he wears his heart on his sleeve. He broadcasts how he's feeling, and look at him go. <laughs> so, so pleased to see him at the highest level of magic, having some success. Commiserations to Shintaro Kurata here, who really, really came uh, ready to play a game of magic as we welcome you back to the booth, my friends. Riley Knight alongside Paul Cheon. A pleasure to have your company for our semi-final, our quarterfinals there, I should say. And uh, we saw some big hits in the feature match area this round, Paul. Yeah, that was, that was looking really, really close until he drew the hazard. Then yeah. it was not close. No, I mean, we're <laughs> talking about, you know, uh, uh, Kurata there looking to transition into the late game, looking to get himself over the line here through, uh, you know, some of the bigger spells that he had. But uh, as I say, Hazaret's spear ended up just being a huge big uh, spanner and that works there. And uh, I mean, full credit to Yam uh, there because uh, he really got it done. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, just, just really impressive. And again, you don't really need to add the black to have kind of that late game, yeah, right? You just it. have a lot of a lot of your great options are already in red, and uh, and Yan Wing Chun just putting on a cl clinic there. That, yeah. I mean, ha Hazard, again, we talked about how that's the key to the matchup, and it didn't really play out that way in the Seth Manfield Paula Vitor matchup, but then here, yeah. it really just got to shine. She's completely dominated. She's yeah. completely stamped her authority on this matchup, on this deck, and we're going to see a lot of her moving forward, I would imagine. My friends, it's time for us to wrap things up here in the booth for now, but stick around because on the other side of this, of course, more magic coming your way from Kyoto, Japan. Paul Cheon, Riley Knight saying goodbye for now, but we'll see you back here for live coverage of Pro Tour Hour of Devastation in just a few moments.
Well, his 12th Pro Tour and his first top eight. Let's hear from the man himself. Our very own Brian David Marshall is down on the floor with Yam Wing Chun. Thanks, Maria. I'm here with Yam Wing Chun. Uh, 12th Pro Tour is what Maria just said in my ear. Mm -hmm. So uh, t talk to me about this journey to get to your first Pro Tour top eight. Uh, I know. It's uh, really amazing because um, basically I don't do very well at the Pro Tour level. Uh, my only money finish is um, Pro Tour Fate Reforge, uh, where I play Burn. And yeah, basically in other format, I mean, uh, for other deck types, I don't really play well. So it's uh, great to be piloting a red deck uh, at this tournament. Yeah, and uh, like coming into this, I never thought I would have top eight this. Uh, yeah, I even like um, talked to my friends that I would dye my hair red if I make top eight. So I guess, uh, yeah, next time you see me, you will see me in red hair. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay, now uh, talk to us a little bit about this matchup. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some similarities between the deck, but th this deck had some cards that could really give you fits, a card like Collective Brutality. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, basically uh, his Collective Brutality is quite good, uh, but the problem is uh, his mana base is a bit uh, like unstable. And uh, I don't really like the card, um, uh, what, the Amit 5-5. I'm in eternal. Uh, yeah, it's good when, cause um, it's good when they're attacking. But in this matchup, uh, like a lot of blocking and standstills, so it it's not very good. Yeah. Okay. Now I have to ask you a question. A lot of people were talking about this, the slow roll every <laughs> time you draw a card. We've seen mm -hmm. this from Li Shi Tian uh, in the past, and and you have uh, followed his uh, footsteps on this. Uh -huh. I need a true or false here. Mm -hmm. True or false, mm -hmm. you have managed to find a way to slow roll yourself while drawing cards on Magic Online. Yeah, that's true. Like, uh, when, <laughs> yeah, we, uh, when we do our play tests, like, uh, f like a few of us would uh, watch someone uh, watch the games, and uh, I would like put out a, a, a card on the screen and to block the cards that we draw and slowly picks it. Yeah, it's so much fun. <laughs> All right, there you have it, Yan Wing Chun. He's having a great time. He's advancing to the semifinals here at Pro Tour Hour of Devastation. Wow, the epic uh, slow roll master uh, there, uh, Yan Wing Chun. What a Chun. terrible person. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really awesome. Great stuff. All right. <laughs> Let's review what's happened so far. We've already had a lot of magic this morning. <laughs> Excuse me. You're right. I'm a little choked up. It's been so emotional. <laughs> Let's take a look at our bracket and review what we've already seen. Paul, you were in the booth for all of this. Take us through what happened. Paulo Vito Damaderosa versus Seth Manfred. Wow, this was <coughs> such an epic match. I'm still just... Even going into the second match, I was still shaking. Paulo Vito Damaderosa mulligating to five. Games one, two, and three. And game three, not looking great. Seth Manfield has a great hand with a ton of removal, a lot of interaction. And one card single-handedly won that game, Aether Sphere Harvester. Oh, absolutely. Wow. And, uh, and being down back against the wall, is it, I mean, this has to be one of the greatest comebacks of all time in the top eight. He was down to five, and, and then he wins it all. It was just so incredible, and and the, the match played up the match played up slightly differently than I kind of expected because of the racing situation with either Free Harvester. It just won him every single game. All right, moving on, what we just saw: Yam Wing Chun victorious over Shintara Kurata. Paul, what did this look like from your vantage point? So this was kind of more in line with how I thought the kind of red aggressive mirror would look like. First person to play Hazret wins the game. Yan Wing Chun, it looks like he's out of resources back, you know, he's like uh, not doing too well. All of a sudden, Hazret off the top, boom. And then it just won him, I, I think two or three of those matches. It was, it was insane. All right, well, the, with the news that Paolo Vida Damodaros is through to the semi-final, that means that the elimination of Seth Manfield leads to Reed Duke being the team captain for the World Magic Cup for Team USA. For Paolo, if he wins his semi-final, he's guaranteed at least a tie for Player of the Year with Marcio pa Carvalho of Portugal, who does lead. So Paolo has to win this semi-final to force a tie. If he then won the final, he'd be Player of the Year outright. If he loses the final, we get a playoff. Mm. Meanwhile, though, 
We're into the bottom half of our bracket, and that means quarterfinal three. Maria, take it away. All right, quarterfinal number three sees Sam Black versus Felix Leong. Sam Black, let's take a look and learn a little bit more about this player here from the United States on Team Mutiny, 35 years old, 410 lifetime pro points. He's got three pro tour top eights under his belt, as well as 14 Grand Prix top eights. Let's take a look at his version of Ram Unap Red. Paul, what can you tell us uh, about his build versus some of the other builds that uh, we've seen coming out of this tournament? So taking a look at Sam Black's build, it's a little more in line with just kind of the traditional builds. He he opted not to actually play more lands that a lot of the other teams opted to go for. He's playing 21 lands. And again, this is a very stock version of, of kind of Ram Unap Red. You know, the, his, you know, the, the strength of his deck, I think, comes, kind of comes in the sideboard. He has some kind of innovative things that we can talk about later. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the big card that's different, first time we've seen on screen, is Cartouche of Zeal. <laughs> What's that doing there? Do you think that's well positioned, given what the field is today? No, I think Cartouche of Zeal is a card that... Uh, shines a lot in kind of the bigger creature matchups, you know, Winding Constrictor. If you're facing a Verdish Gearhulk, you're like, man, how am I going to get through that thing? That's where you want the Cartouche of Zeal. In a, in a world where everybody is just playing mono red and just attacking, I don't think it really does a whole lot because most of your creatures already have haste. All right, so what about player two? Who's Sam Black up against? Well, he's up against Felix Leung of Singapore. He's 34, 33 lifetime pro points. Um, he's going to easily double his lifetime pro tour earnings. It's his first Pro Tour top eight. Um, seven, two, and one, a decent standard uh, record. Uh, booster draft uh, was where he really shined, though, five and one. So uh, you can see him there. He's in the MTG Mint Cup because MTG Mint, MTG Bent, and there's a sort of squad all around, the kind of AAA affiliates, if you will. They really are a big squad, um, and there's going to be a lot of people cheering for Felix Leong. Let's take a look at his list, and here it is. It's Ramanap Red once again, um, and counting up the lands, Paul, 23 this time around. Yeah, and I think actually, you know, I've seen enough players lose with three lands in play and has written in hand that I think you want to go up and play more lands because, of course, you already have access to Ramanap Ruins, you have the Reshaker Kenra, you have have the hazard red, you're never getting flooded when you're playing this deck. So I think it's better to just make sure you can hit your land drops at least until turn four. You were talking in the booth a lot how the red mirror is kind of an attrition battle. Can you kind of break that down as to what you mean and why it's so important to keep track of that as you're watching the games? Uh, well, yeah, it, that comes into play, especially more after sideboard because you're looking to play a lot of two for ones uh, because oftentimes last threat standing wins. The card that kind of breaks the mold for all of that is Hazareth, though, because there's no card in, in either side that actually effectively deals with this card, except when you play your own. Then you get into this really, really weird, funky game state where you're both just having Hazareth in play, staring at each other and going, to you, to you, to you, to you, and person with the highest life total usually ends up winning. All right, well, we'll see how it plays out. It is time for our next Ramanap Red Mirror, Sam Black against Felix Leong in quarterfinal three of Proto Hour of Devastation. <laughs> 